So my first question is, how did you actually start your cooking career? I would have to say it started when I was four years old, actually. Um, my, uh, I grew up in a very poor family, and we did not have a lot of extra cooking gadgets like a toaster oven. So when we would make toast in the morning, uh, my mother or my grandmother would make it in the oven itself, like underneath the broiler. So they'd get this cookie sheet, and they'd put bread there and butter on top, and then they'd slide it underneath the broiler oven and then take it back out. And at four years old, I was really captivated by the fact that this white bread would go in and it would come out brown. And so I told my grandmother, I want to know how you do that because it's like magic. And so she took out a loaf of stale bread and a stick of butter and she showed me how to put the butter on the bread and how to put it into the oven. And after I had made a couple of pans and she was certain that I wouldn't burn myself, right? she left to go clean uh, the kitchen and I continued to practice. And uh, at one point that afternoon, she was walking past the door of the kitchen and she heard me talking out loud to myself. I was bragging, <laughs> saying, who ever heard of a four-year-old who knew how to make toast? So... <laughs> So that was uh, the first thing that I learned to make, and then uh, very shortly after that, I took an interest in at any time mom or grandma would be in the kitchen, I would watch how they would make things. So then I learned how to make buttermilk biscuits, and then I learned how to make pancakes, and then I learned how to make bread, and uh, it just kind of spiraled from there. So uh, at some point in your uh, cooking activity, MasterChef came along. So how did you actually get into the MasterChef competition? Well, MasterChef was not the first time that I had done cooking reality TV. My friends have always told me, you know, you belong on TV, especially cooking. And so I actually was on the Rachel Ray Show in 2007 on a competition they had called So You Think You Can Cook. And that kind of whet my appetite for it. And I enjoyed television, but I also hated it at the same time. The competitive aspects of it aren't really up my alley because I don't like, you know, people fighting in conflict and things like that. Um, so I had kind of sworn off it after the Rachel Ray so I said, I'm not going to do reality TV anymore. Uh, but then a bunch of my friends watched the first season of MasterChef. And they were like, oh, no, this is perfect. They focus on the food. They don't focus on the fighting between individuals. And you'll love it. And you, you have to do it because it's perfect for you. And I said, nope, I've sworn off it. I'm not going to do it. So they actually went online to the MasterChef website uh, for casting and filled out an application for me. Oh, my and then goodness. And then the MasterChef casting people called me the day before they were having their open auditions in Dallas. And they said, we've looked at your application online and we're really interested in you. We'll, we'll give you a VIP spot at our auditions if you'll come. And I was like, what? I did not apply for MasterChef. But they convinced me on the phone to go down. And so I did. And then next thing I knew, I was in L.A. making the show. Wow. So um, how was it? Tell me a little more about how it was to be inside the whole production. You know, it's something completely new, actually, as a, as a format. So I'm really curious to know how it works. You know, it's, uh, it's nothing like what it looks like on television. <laughs> you know, All right. I crammed and watched the whole first season right before I left for L.A. And then when we got there, you know, they, they bust us to this dusty warehouse in a really terrible part of L.A. And they had to have, like, security guards because there was so much crime in the neighborhood. Wow. And the warehouse was filthy. There were uh, rusty nails sticking out of the pieces of the set. And you had to be careful where you sat down. And, you know, wow. I thought, it looks so different when it comes, you know, across on the screen. So that was the first thing I noticed is that, you know, it's definitely a set. And you only see this much on the camera. But around it are, you know, pipes and 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 clumps of dirt and things you just they never show that you know on the camera so it looks different first of all uh second of all when you see one episode of the show and there are you know two challenges that take place back to back it actually may take us three or four days to film that one episode so we have to wear the exact same clothes uh, we can't wash the clothes between days because if you get a big stain of tomato sauce you know on your shoulder and then suddenly that disappears in the next scene, and an audience member is going to wonder what's going on. So right. we have the exact same clothes from day to day. The girls have to do their makeup and hair the exact same way. Right. Uh, it's really interesting how you build this fictional world of one television day that actually may take three or four or five days to film. Um, another thing that's interesting is uh, when you'll see us cooking, then the camera will pan over to us in a room saying, oh, my goodness, I just put my beans in the pot, but they're not done yet, and I've only right. got 30 left we may film that interview three or four days after the actual challenge took place 
So it can be a, a, a difficulty to, you know, kind of get your mindset back into the moment right. when something's happening uh, so that you can, you know, experience that panic and, and get back into the character and say, oh, okay, this is what was going on. So, so it's, it's very, very weird to watch an episode, you know, put together and you watch it 45 minutes from start to finish. And in reality, that was an entire week of your life. And, you know, things right. are placed in different orders and stuff. So it's very, very strange. Yeah, and it was uh, quite long, actually. You know, you, you get this strange feeling when you watch the show because it's um, it's 45 minutes and you don't really understand how the real timing it actually is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there's there are some mentions like we last week we've done that, you know, but last week was like last episode. Yeah. So you don't really know what the timing is. Um, what about the, uh, the, rela the relationships inside the group? I mean, how did those develop in time? Um, oh my god, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> when we all met each other, first we met in this large group of 100 people. And so people developed very close friendships in the, in the beginning, but then by the end of that week, all but 18 of those people were gone. So mm -hmm. you start to develop initial friendships and then you're torn apart and those people get eliminated and sent home. And now you're down to these top 18 and you realize, oh, this is a competition and I'm fighting with these people for the title. So in the first week or so, tension was very high. And there was a group of the cast that was a little bit more experienced than the others. Some people had had a little bit of professional experience here and there. And then there were other members of the cast that had never set foot in a professional kitchen ever. And so there was a lot of tension and there were some screaming matches and even some outright like fights that were taking place in the beginning. And I can't handle that kind of stuff because I, I need peace and harmony and love around me at all times. So I actually tried to leave the show at that point and said, you know, really? if people are fighting, uh, I can't deal with this because you're sequestered from your friends and family. You cannot call your loved ones, your friends, your family at all while you're making the show. You're completely separated from the outside world for two months. Wow. So the only family that you have are your fellow contestants. And you basically live, eat, and breathe, you know. Where do you actually live during that two months period? We lived in a hotel in Culver City. Mm -hmm. um, everybody had their own room. Uh, but we're, you know, together all the time. And so I, you know, I told the producers, I'm like, I can't deal with this if the only family that I have is constantly yelling and fighting. I have to leave the show. Right. And they said, well, you can't leave the show, so you've got to make of this, you know, what you're going to make of it. So uh, there was one other contestant that was in the same boat as me, and she actually lives here in the same city I do. And we sat everybody down in a circle, and we said, guys, listen, Please. we can either be miserable and hate each other and fight constantly for the next two months, or we can be a family and love and support each other and each encourage each other to do our best in the competition and whoever is the best wins. And from that point on, we were all basically friends. But the dynamic of reality TV show contestants is very strange because, you know, you do all love each other. You spend all your time together uh, and, and you become very close. But then you get pulled into an interview where, there, where it's just you and the interviewer. And they want you to talk very honestly about what you think about your fellow contestant. So, you know, people have this friend face with every one of their fellow contestants. But then it's a different story. They're a competitor when they go in for their interview. So right. you don't see any of that footage until the show airs. So some people that were in their interviews really talking trash about everybody else, nobody knew that's what they were saying until we watched the show air months after we filmed it. So, so you could, what, what surprises did you have when you saw the, uh, the actual show? Uh, there were just some very, very blatant and upfront nasty comments from a few competitors, primarily Max, who uh, was eliminated earlier in the beginning. Uh, but also, Susie had some very interesting one-liners where she was dishing on some folks' uh, dishes and things like that. And you're like, wow, I can't believe she would say that. She never said that to me to my face. Right. But, you know, that's how the engine works. The, the person interviewing you is, is trained on getting that kind of information out of you and, and having you talk very candidly about what you think about your fellow contestants. And so tact goes away. When you go into the reality TV interview, there is no longer any tact. You're speaking very honestly what you think in a way that you would rarely be that candid to a person's face. Right, so the, the strange thing actually is that you never hear the person you, you talk to when you do the interview. It's only you. Right. Uh, yeah, that, 
that's another interesting aspect about reality TV is that they teach you to reiterate the question that they ask in your response. So if the interviewer will say, okay, uh, you're running out of time right now, what are you going to do? I can't just say, oh, I'm going to change my recipe. Right. You have to reiterate the question, oh, I'm running out of time. I've only got five minutes left. So what I'm going to do is, right. so you're in this weird kind of banter with the person who's interviewing you so that they never have to edit their voice asking the question. Right. So um, I was wondering, uh, after you did the show, did you get any kind of um, proposals like work or for other shows? Uh, actually, uh, Gordon Ramsay's production company did sign me to a development contract. So they are interested in right. possibly producing a show with me in the future. Uh, so I work with them out in, out in Los Angeles. And I actually have two other entities that are talking to me right now about producing shows, and they're actually moving forward into the production aspect. So I actually have a production meeting for a show uh, next Monday. So there are a lot of opportunities that are coming up, but you know, just because you make a show does not mean that it's ever going to air on television. You know, the television world is so bizarre and so complex that you know, production companies will invest tens of thousands of dollars into the production of a show, And it might not ever make it onto air for a network. Even if the network agrees to buy it, it may not ever even air. So uh, just keeping my fingers crossed that some good stuff will come out of it. I've been doing lots of catering gigs, lots of appearances, lots of classes, uh, teaching classes and, and things like that. So I'm, I'm busier than I've ever been in my entire life. So uh, how was it to work with uh, people like Gordon Ramsay or Joe Bastianich? You know, you discover that... Television personalities have their on-camera face and their off-camera face. Right. A little bit shocked that uh, Ramsey and, and Joe and Graham were so different in their off-camera personalities because formerly when I worked with Rachel Ray, she's the exact same person when the camera turns off as she is when the camera turns on. You know, she can't handle a script. If, if the, the writers for the show tell her, you have to say this, she's like, I can't do it. I have to just talk out of my head. That's the only way you know, that I can do it. So, so I was accustomed to her, you know, being very similar when the camera turned off. But Ramsey and Joe and Graham, well, Graham is pretty much the same when the camera turns off, but Joe, who is known for being this, you know, blood-curdlingly cruel judge, is actually very, like, chill and low-key and relaxed off-camera. So he's nothing on camera like he is off-camera. He's a totally different person. And, you know, Ramsey has, is famous for having this crazy temper and being a potty mouth and all this kind of stuff on camera. But when the camera turns off, it's like this switch flips and he becomes as nice off camera as he is mean on camera. So he'll see you in the hall backstage and he'll come up and be like, ah, how are you, Ben Star? What's going on? And he'll pick me up and give me a big hug and kiss. And, you know, he's not like that at all you know, right. on camera. So. So that was kind of, it took me aback a bit to, to see how genuine and friendly these guys were off stage. Right, that's, that's brilliant. So uh, <laughs> I also know you have a personal blog, so what's up with that? <clears throat> how was that that's, born? Well, I have actually maintained my website, benstar.com, for almost 15 years. Uh, I used it as a vehicle for me, uh, for me to share my travels with friends and family originally because I'm a travel writer. And uh, up until about two or three years ago, I spent about six months abroad uh, of the year. So that was a way for me to send back photos and stories of my travels so that my close family and friends could keep track of it. But then it started just kind of a, a, a attracting a larger and larger following. And then I basically had an audience of people who were just kind of wondering where I was going next and what I was going to do. And uh, then I, I discovered some more uh, personal loves in my life. I, I brew beer and make wine, and so that kind of added on to the blog. And then I started a huge organic garden when I finally bought a house. And then I rebuilt the house when I got the house. And so that, you know, DIY, do your own uh, stuff at home, became a part of it. So my website was a fairly large and diverse blog, uh, if you will, back before people even knew what blogging was. Um, and now, of course, I've got a much larger audience. This is since Rachel Ray and MasterChef. And my blog is antiquated and outdated. And so I'm currently in the process of learning PHP and MySQL so that I can make the website more interactive. So people can basically tweet one of my blog posts or share it on Facebook directly from my website or comment on the blog on my post because my website's never been that advanced. So right. I'm, I'm playing with that right now, but I'm hoping to have all that fixed in the next two weeks. Perfect. Um, so one other question I'd like to ask you is uh, what is 
the travel that you remember with most pleasure? You know, the one that enriched you the most? This is a long story. <laughs> uh, I've got I'll time. <laughs> okay. Um, it was New Year's Eve, 1990. No, 2000 and the cusp of 2001 to 2002. September 11th had just happened here in the U.S. Right. And my closest friend's mother lived in Cairo. And she had invited me to come and spend New Year's Eve with her in Cairo. And she was going to show me all of Egypt. And so I went just a few months after September 11th had happened. So all my friends were like, oh, you're going to get kidnapped. You're going to get killed. You're going to get assassinated. Uh, but I went anyway. And I was at a point in my life where it was a real <sighs> fulcrum point for me because my family had always told me, oh, you need to grow up and become a senator. They wanted me to become president. They wanted, you know, and I, I diverged and sort of did my own thing. And, and the family was disappointed in me and they thought, you know, you're – you have so much more potential than what you're doing, and here you are just kind of wandering around the world, you know, with a backpack on, living on people's couches. We don't understand. You know, you need to be back in law school. Right. So I was, I was engaged in this personal struggle, wondering if I was throwing my life away, doing what I wanted to do, or should I be living my life according to other people's expectations? And, you know, I was in terrible financial shape. I was living paycheck to paycheck. I had to you know, sell a musical instrument that I had in order to go on this trip. And that was a musical instrument my parents had hoped I would continue playing for the rest of my life. And so at, at this particular moment of this trip, I was confused about my future. I was confused about what I wanted from life. And I was very frustrated financially. That sets the thing. So New Year's Eve, uh, we are in a hotel on the Red Sea coast in the town of Dahab. My best friend and I and his mother. And we have this fabulous meal and they're whirling dervishes dancing, and, and we're getting drunk on terrible Egyptian wine. The wine in Egypt is awful. And uh, about 10 o'clock at night, we go to sleep for two hours because we have to get up and drive to Mount Sinai because our goal for this trip was to climb Mount Sinai and watch the sun rise from the peak of Mount Sinai on the new year, which is a thing that people from many different faiths do. So we wake up at midnight hungover, we drive three hours through the bleak desert of the Sinai Peninsula. There are no towns, nothing. Right. We get to the, the parking lot for St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai, and we begin the climb. And it's a seven-mile climb wow. with 5,000 feet of elevation gain. It's a brutal hike. My friend's mother can't do it, so she hires a camel. And she gets on top of this camel, and the camel takes off. And, you know, he says, we have to stay with her. We can't leave her. She's, you know, an American woman by herself. So we're basically running up this very steep trail behind a camel that's very gassy. And oh, damn. that was awful. So we are exhausted by the time we get up to the peak of Mount Sinai. Uh, we get a blanket and wrap it around us. And there's a little Bedouin up there selling hot tea. So we have cups of hot tea. And my feet are dangling right over the edge of a cliff almost a thousand meters high Wow! and there are clouds below us and then suddenly in the distance the sun just peaks above the horizon and all of the clouds in the valley below us rise past us and just dissipate and there are probably two or three hundred people on the mountain peak at this time and as soon as the sun sets its light everyone begins to sing and they're singing in dozens of different languages and and here are people of the Jewish, uh, Christian, and Muslim faith, and even atheists, you know, all together on the top of this mountain. And I'm thinking, everywhere else but this point, these religious groups are poised for war against each other. In Iraq, in Afghanistan, Israel, in Egypt, everywhere. And, but here, everything is peace and, and beauty and joy. And so I just cry my eyes out. You know, you saw on the show, I cry at the drop of a hat. So I ball for like an hour, and I'm exhausted. And then we have to hike seven miles back down, get in the car, and then we have a three-hour drive across bleak Sinai Desert back to our hotel before we can go to sleep. So my friend's mother decides that she's going to drive, and I'm sitting in the back seat. And I've been on many road trips where the driver fell asleep and drove off the road, so I'm very nervous. And she's driving, and she begins to rest her head against no the No way. I'm like, oh, no, she is going to fall asleep. And I keep saying, Debbie, do you want me to drive? And she's, oh, 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 no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. Don't worry, you can go to sleep, I'm fine. No way. So <laughs> we're about an hour and a half or two hours outside of St. Catherine's Monastery, probably 100 kilometers. 
and we're approaching this this steep curve of the road where it goes down into a deep canyon. And she's approaching the curve at maybe 60 kilometers per hour, and she's not slowing down. And I'm thinking, mm-hmm. she's probably asleep. And oh my God. so, but I don't want to be a backseat driver because I hate upsetting people. But I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, Debbie, do you see the curve ahead? And she wakes up, she was dead asleep, yeah. screams, puts on the brakes, but we, we plow right into the guardrail that's on the side of the, the thing and the, there's sand and dust all over the road. She loses control of the car and it spins over, rolls once and lands like down this rocky slope halfway down into the canyon. Oh my goodness. And then my friend wakes up because he was dead asleep the whole time and we all look at each other like, oh my goodness. Right. I'm in survival mode and I say, okay, we're 100 kilometers from St. Catherine's Monastery. If I start hiking now, I know I can hike 30 kilometers a day. Um, so it will take me three days to go back and reach the monastery to get help. And God. Debbie's, no, 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 wait. Somebody will come along this road. We'll just wait and somebody will come along and help us. So we go sit on the side of the road. Oh, and this guy. I, high into the sky and you know it had been freezing at night but now it's you know blazing hot right and we had one little bottle of water and so we were sharing the bottle of water and then it's out and then i i begin to think I, i'm gonna die here i'm gonna die in the desert drama queen uh, and i lay my head back against the rock and the sun is hot and i'm sweating and then i start hearing bells and i and i think this is it. I'm dying, and the gates of heaven are opening, and I'm hearing the bells of heaven ringing. And then my friend next to me says, does anybody else hear bells? And I said, yes, 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 we're, we're dying. It's, it's the bells of heaven. Just accept it and go to the light. He's like, you idiot. I hear bells. Where are the bells coming from? I had to come back to consciousness, and I look down in the canyon, and there's a camel train of Bedouins. <clears throat> right. And and so my friend Debbie, who has lived in Cairo for six years and speaks pretty good Arabic, you know, hollers at them, and we scramble down into the canyon, and she tries to explain. She points to our car, which is fairly well crushed, uh, up on the, the side of the cliff. And uh, they talk back and forth. And then they basically pick us up and put us on their camels and take us to their tent village, which was five or six miles down the canyon at the base of this giant, like, windswept sandstone cave. And they were all living in tents there. And uh, the women of the village came out, and they killed a goat right then and started cooking for us and and they put us in this wonderful tent on these beautiful mattress things wow. and, uh, then all the men of the village got into their uh, got their camels and and went off to i guess try to figure out what to do with the car so we're sitting there and all of the children from the village come out and and they're giving us little toys that they had made and beautiful little sculptures and carvings and and i'm sitting there thinking okay this whole trip i have been so paranoid about money I'm going to run out of money and when I get back I'm not going to have any money left and I realized you know in my wallet I probably had 80 or 100 dollars left for my trip which was not a lot but I'm probably sitting on more money than these people have ever seen in their entire life at one time yet here they are killing their last goat to make a meal for me and, and begging me to take these things that you know they're treasured possession. And, right. and so that really struck me. And then as the men of the village came back, we had this huge feast and everyone was singing and dancing. And I saw how happy these people were who have nothing yet are still willing to give the last bit of everything they have to a stranger who has just, you know, crashed from the heavens. That's, that was a really amazing moment for me. And I, I realized at that point that it's a waste to spend your life obsessing over money. It's a waste to spend your life obsessing over success. It's a waste to do these things because it distracts you from the things that are truly important in life, which are family, friends, love, happiness, generosity, these things. And so I was basically stunned and in a daze at this revelation. And, you know, they put us back on the camels and they took us back and they had gotten the car down off the cliff and all four tires were still intact, even though the roof was like crushed in. And we were able to get in and drive the car down the canyon where there was a little dirt road that went back up onto the main highway. And so we got up there, and, and all of the Bedouins were there, and a very common custom in the Middle East is, is tipping. It's called bekshish, and you give bekshish if you are a person of, of greater financial status than somebody else that helps you do anything, whether they give you directions or open a door for you, you're supposed to give them bekshish. It, it's right. a principle of the Muslim religion. 
And so Debbie opens her purse to just dig out every dollar that she has because these people literally saved our lives. And she, she brings out this fistful of money and she hands it to you know, the chief of this, this village. And he says, no, no, our God commands us to help those who are in need. And she's flabbergasted by this because she lives in Cairo where everyone is constantly demanding vaccination. And she says, no, 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 please take this. Buy you know, education for your children, you know, do something with right. this. this you. And he said, no, absolutely not. It is our honor to help you. You are a traveler in need. And, and this, is, this is how we behave because we hope that if we are a traveler in need someday, someone will help us as well. And I just, I mean, the waterworks just, you know, opened up. And I cried all the way to back to our hotel. And I have never since been the same person after that moment. That, that to me, really sums up what travel is about and what you can learn from it. So the whole tourism and staying in nice hotels and sightseeing, that's not for me anymore. I, I have to go and engage with the people because that's what you truly, that's where you truly change your life and, and open your worldview when you truly interact with the people who live in the destination. I think that's one of the most amazing travel stories I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> Man, I'm serious, I'm serious. So, um, I, you know, any question I'm going to ask you now, it's just not going to be the same, you know, after <laughs> hearing this. <laughs> I mean, you, you put it up there, you know. So, um, um, a few more questions before uh, we're done. I'm um, I'm very curious about um, the food travels you do because I've seen you actually have been uh, to Brazil and uh, you know there's so much you can learn from other cultures uh, food traditions so how do you yeah. live that how do you interact with that well before I began traveling internationally I grew up in a very poor family um, so I was only exposed to the cuisine of my culture, which was American Southern cuisine. So even by the time I was 19 or 20, I still had not tasted anything beyond that other than Mexican food. I'd never tasted Thai food. I'd never tasted Italian food. Right. And then I was basically dropped suddenly into this world where I was traveling, but I was not wealthy enough to be able to stay in hotels. So I was doing a thing that you, they now call couch surfing, where you basically just find somebody that will let you stay on their couch or yeah. in what's called a meet, meet the people or, or a, a lot of government range programs where you can stay with a local family and in exchange for a few dollars a day. Right. I was doing that sort of a thing. So at night, I was not going out to restaurants to dine. I was going into the kitchen with mama and grandma right. and watching them cook the foods of their culture. And during the day, I would go with them to the markets and find out what they're buying and what ingredients there are that I'm not familiar with and spices and new spices and, and things like that. And so basically I learned to cook in the home kitchens of the world, including my parents' home kitchen. And mm -hmm. so I'm entirely, you know, taught by the people, by the peasants, you know, by, by people who have preserved these cooking traditions through the generations of their families. Which is the best way actually. Exactly. Yes. And so you know, that was a, a thing that I, I felt was, a disadvantage for me on MasterChef because these people, you know, my fellow contestants were making restaurant quality cuisine, you know, and I make farmhouse foods. But I feel like I have a, such a connection to those foods because of the way that I learned to make them. I learned from people, from grandmothers, right. their grandmothers. And, and so my whole philosophy on cooking has this kind of family legacy, you know, stretching back through the generations. And I feel like that's what food is really about. It's not about going to a restaurant and spending $40 for a plate of brilliantly executed cuisine. That's not that interesting to me. What's interesting is the story behind the food and where it came from and who made it and who taught them to make it and where did that person learn. And, and so I've come to this philosophy about food that is, you know, through my travels, that is basically this. No matter who you are, what your culture, religion, socioeconomic status, disregarding all of that, when it comes time for you to celebrate life and love with the people you care about, whether you are a billionaire living in a palace on the Mediterranean or a Bedouin living in a tent in Egypt, you get into the kitchen 
and get your hands dirty to cook for the people that you love. And that is how people all around the world celebrate with each other. So cooking is one of the only international languages. It is one of the only things that every human being on this planet shares with every human being. Okay, so, um, you know, you, you set the standard again up there, so anything <laughs> I'm going to ask you now, I'm, I mean, I'm just, um, okay. So uh, I was, uh, I'm wondering, what are your plans for the future at this point? Um, I was overwhelmed by the response that I received from MasterChef. In the week after I got eliminated, I received more than 10,000 emails Facebook messages and tweets. And that took me by surprise, but all of the messages seem to have this similar theme, and it's, we're so tired of seeing fighting and hatred and anger and, and, uh, and conflict on television. It was refreshing to see somebody that wanted everybody else to win as much as they wanted to. It was is refreshing to see humanity and tenderness and vulnerability. And to me, that means there is a very underserved audience out there that's watching TV that wants this kind of stuff. And so I feel like I would be doing a disservice to those people who have asked me to stay on their television screens to not make an effort to do that. So in the short term, I'm making concerted effort to try to get back on television, but in a capacity that is doing good for people. You know, there are a few shows on television that do that. Desperate or uh, Extreme Home Makeover is, is one of them where they take a disadvantaged family and they basically transform their house into, you know, the house of their dreams. And, and it's that sort of a thing that I feel like television should be filled with. Not people fighting and, you know, having their million dollar weddings and getting divorced three months later and, you know, that sort of a thing. And so I really feel like television is has an amazing potential to change people's lives and to spread a message of love and peace rather than conflict and hate. And so that's what I'm working on right now. When I get back on TV and have a show that warms people's hearts, that warms people's hearts and teaches them to be decent and kind and to love their fellow man. And then over the long term, I have fallen in love with the big island of Hawaii. Um, I've been there probably seven times in the last two years. I stay on an, in a tree house on an organic ginger farm when I go there. Uh, with some friends who have a farm, and I'm just like, I see myself creating this paradise of a place to visit on the Big Island of Hawaii, and it's it's a sustainable farm, and it produces an incredible amount of, of organic food in a very sustainable, closed system way, but it's also a great place for people to come and stay on the farm, whether they're just looking for a getaway, you know, to, to not have television or internet or the cell phone around them, and just to be surrounded by the beauty of nature, or If they want to get their hands dirty and discover, you know, how grapes are grown or, you know, how guavas are grown or, and processed. And I want to have a restaurant there that uses only the foods that are grown on the farm and, and to show you how you can produce this amazing food basically from your backyard. And, and so I want it to be a sort of classroom for the world on how we can get back to this local, sustainable type of agriculture that in Europe you have really enjoyed much more so than we have in the U.S. We've just upgraded to this awful industrial agricultural system and it's taken us away from our roots uh, in the soil. So so ultimately I want to have my wonderful sustainable guest farm in Hawaii but that's going to require a little bit of money and I got to make it first. So Okay, so it's going to be some work before that but it's totally yeah. worth it. Yes. Okay, Ben, I thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure.